The math is very clear. You know, nine out of 10 people fail in their entrepreneurial venture. Nine out of 10 people never even try. We're talking about a very small group of people who have the ability to sustain their livelihood predicated on their own ability to drive their own business. Gary, thanks for doing this. Happy to do it. Now, growing up, how often were you told no? Uh, 98% of the time. You know, I wasn't a good student. I wasn't a good enough athlete. Um, I was trying to sell stuff from the age of six. And uh, that's just one big game of no, all three of those things. So no is, no is the thing that I'm most comfortable with. No is the framework of my life. Yeah. Um, no is an entrepreneur's best friend. Really? Really. It's just something most people don't talk about. You know, until you get comfortable with no, you have absolutely no shot to be successful as an entrepreneur. Okay. And that is why 99% fail because they're addicted to the thought of yes and they fear no. Once you figure out how to make no your best friend is the second you become unstoppable. Guys, can we get quiet on set please? Um, um, did you fail school? Did I fail it? I mean, I got through it, but that's because America, they don't wanna fail you. Mm. I mean, I literally never opened my book in high school and they passed me. So they, you know, what I observed later in my life was, oh, it was worse data for them to not pass me through than it was for them to actually care about me. They didn't need the statistic of somebody failing for their record. They could care less about the fact that I wasn't getting educated in their point of view. Um, And that was just fine by me because the way they wanted to educate me was not something that I believed in either and so it was a good trade. Did the school fail you? You know what's funny? I, yes and no. Mm. You know, in the past I would say yes. The school failed me but I also chose to fail within that environment. Mm. So the school has a system and they don't adjust. Um, and then it's up to the child or the student to conform or not. So I think we failed each other the good news is, I don't think it had an impact on either. Did it harness your creative? 100%. Entrepreneurial yes. desire? Yes. You know, I think, I don't think I've ever articulated the relationship with no as well as I did in the first question here, mm. ever. It's funny how you'll never know what's gonna come out of your mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think one of the great vulnerabilities of our society right now is that we overcoddle children mm. and we give 10th place ribbons and we, we do all sorts of things to try to make people feel better and what we're creating is false environments and we're creating a lot of anxiety and worry because once they go to the real world, the real world doesn't understand that game. The market does what the market does. There is no mommy or daddy to make it better. Mm. And um, I'm very grateful for the way I was brought up as an immigrant, uh, as as a losing player in the norms of the way we looked at it. And I would say that that adversity has been the foundation of my adulthood success, mentally, Mm. let alone financially. Well, you didn't have it easy. You had it really hard, right? You know, it's funny. Yes, by the way, it's red, right? Mm. You know, know, immigrant upbringing, working like a dog since I was 13. But I was that animal. You know, we look at athletes and we say, they didn't have it easy. They had to train so hard for the Olympics. But then if you go talk to that 16 year old skier, it's all she knows. All I knew was how to be a working dog. Yeah. How would you describe the life of an entrepreneur? Um, Not half pregnant. That's how I think about it. I think it's a game of edges. The highs are enormously high and the lows are enormously low. Uh, So it's not safe. It's uncomfortable. It's, um, it's always on. If you're truly an entrepreneur, if it's really yours, you know, I've never articulated this way, but what just came to mind is, if you know somebody who's a parent, if you go talk to an 88 year old parent, what I think she or he will say to you is, you're always a parent. You know, that 88 year old will look at you and tell you that they're worried about their 67 year old child. Yeah. And, 
I think that anybody who's watching right now who's not an entrepreneur but has children, especially if those children are over the age of 20, can really understand what it is to be an entrepreneur, which is you're always the last line of defense, it's always on you, and it's forever until you're dead. Is it lonely? In, in, uh, unbelievably lonely. Which is great for me because I, believe it or not, am unbelievably comfortable with 5,000 people in an audience and 50 people around me as I am sitting by myself. As a matter of fact, on this trip, I requested to have some flights by myself because I'm in some really thoughtful mode and I, I want it. I like being lonely. I enjoy it. Mm. And in my own head, I'm the loneliest. And I think that that is a strength of mine, not a weakness. Mm. Is it worth it then? Pfft, hell yes. <laughs> For me, yeah. I don't know any different. Mm-hmm. I do not believe it's worth it for m- the majority of people who are watching, mm-hmm. who are now aspiring to be entrepreneurs because they are the current cool thing. Mm-hmm. Well, it's important to know that, isn't it? That it, it it's not for everyone. No, not only is it not for everyone, it's actually not for most. Mm-hmm. The math is very clear. You know, nine out of 10 people fail in their entrepreneurial venture, nine out of 10 people never even try. We're talking about a very small group of people who have the ability to sustain their livelihood predicated on their own ability to drive their own business. Mm. It's really interesting how you set it up and you set it up perfectly in my opinion. We are currently in the golden era of entrepreneurship. Everybody wants to be one. Mm -hmm. It's actually not for most people. Now, on the flip side, let me go contrary. The internet allows for the first time a lot of people to actually be one practically. It's that it's lonely. It's not that you can't do it. The people that are watching right now, I believe they can do it. I believe they can make a million dollars, a hundred thousand, forget a million, a hundred thousand a year selling, you know, a bikini they made on Instagram. I don't think most people are inherently good at the pressure that comes along with it. Which is year one, it's a hundred thousand. Year two, it's 400,000. Year three, it's 200,000 because Instagram changed its algorithm and new competitors have come in. And oh, by the way, they screwed up because going from 100,000 to 400,000, they got fancy and they bought a too expensive car and a second apartment. And now that it's 200,000, the whole thing breaks. But now they're known as successful and they can't deal with the scarlet letter of everybody's judgment that they have to take a step back and sell that apartment. That's the problem. (laughs) Got it? Got it. Got it. Do you, have you heard of the tall poppy syndrome? No, but it's funny you said that. Mm. Because three people tweeted that exact terminology to me on a flight last night. Yeah. And I was going to Google what it meant, but then I got a pop-up, because right now I'm in a cocoon of buying sports cards, and I've been trying to buy up a bunch of messy rookie cards, mm. and I got a notification from eBay, so I got sidetracked and I had to go buy it. But I'm thrilled now, because now you get to tell me what it is. Tall poppy is, well, you're, you're the tall poppy and everyone else is trying to bring you down. I see. Yeah, so it's called the tall poppy syndrome. It's funny, I have a saying that says there's two ways to build the biggest building. One, just be good enough to build the biggest building in town. Two, try to tear down everybody else's building. I very much disrespect people who tear down buildings. Mm. I couldn't be more disrespectful of all the small poppies that are wasting all their time trying to tear down the big poppy mm. instead of focusing on their own poppy and building a bigger poppy than somebody else's. (laughs) And telling that poppy no. Telling, yeah, yeah, I mean like, to me, I'm not just, I'm just not worried about anybody else's poppy. Mm. I don't care how big or small your poppy is. I'm gonna focus on my poppy, (laughs) and that's what I'm about. And, and And by the way, here's something else I'm very proud of. If you go out and build a bigger poppy, I'm your number one fan. When I, I get a lot of accolades for my angel investing, but I'm often, when I get too much accolades, to say, hey, did you look at Scott Belsky and Chris Saka? They did it better than I did and I was part of that gush book. So I'm not worried about anybody else's poppy and if I happen to build a bigger one, then I want clapping and the cheers for that. But if somebody else builds a bigger one, I'm not booing it, Mm -hmm. I'm admiring it. Especially if that poppy didn't use, you know, fertilizer that was illegal. Mm, yeah. Got it? Got it, yeah. You know, that's some people. I think that's a lot of trouble with this country that, that we do have that tall poppy syndrome. And I wish it was different. Well, that's, you know, that's probably America's great strength. Absolutely. You know, yeah. they're, they cheer success mm. um, to a fault at times. Um, but, you know, that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, the school system here, I'm not sure about America, but it's, it's outdated. 
Do it's you, outdated globally. It's outdated globally. The internet made it outdated because information is a commodity mm. and the school system was built on me- memorization of information. Mm. Why do I have to do any math? I have a calculator on my iPhone that can give you any math. Yeah. I don't need to know anything. I can ask Siri and Alexa in two seconds they'll give me the answer. You know, who cares about the periodic table when I can tell you what, like it's just, it's so uncomfortably outdated globally because it's predicated on memorization of information in a world where we have information at our fingertip within a second for zero cost. The whole thing's dead. How do we fix it? Uh, it's the parent's responsibility. Mm. It's the parent's responsibility to not buy into the self-esteem wrapped up in your child going to a top university. We don't need to boil the ocean. Parents need to make sure their kids are happy. If, you just fo- if we all collectively actually gave a crap about the happiness of our children, it would fix itself. Unfortunately, we care more about the judgment of our contemporaries about what our children are accomplishing more than caring about our children. This is an issue of modern day parenting and insecurity and keeping up with the Joneses, mm-hmm. not a school system problem. Caring what other people think. Too. It is the devastation of our society. Yeah, because so many people watching this will be like, no, you need a university degree. You need to that to fall back on. What fall saying? back on what? Yeah. Every company's not requiring a degree to get hired anyway. The greatest companies in the world, Amazon, Google, are no longer requiring degree anyway. Mm. So what are you falling back on? Now, you know, that's like saying you need to keep a horse on hand in case the car doesn't work. It's ludicrous. It is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. Yeah. And it's completely predicated on the framework that the parent grew up with and more importantly, the judgment that their parents are putting on them or how they want to keep up with everybody else. Because the people that they eat dinner with at the country club on Sunday night, their daughter's going to the big university and they want, it's just ludicrous. It is sad. I'm a byproduct of parents that were strong enough to not care about what other people thought, which is why I'm happy. And I would like to use what the gift my parents gave to me as something that I communicate to the world, hopefully inspiring one parent to give that gift to their child. Yeah, what do you say to that entrepreneur, that young entrepreneur at school, hating school, wanting to leave school, but has to stay at school? What do you say to them? And- Enjoy the vacation because you're gonna work the rest of your life. Two, don't be a hypocrite. If you're such a tough guy or gal, stop taking mommy and daddy's money. If you're such an entrepreneur, go buy your own iPhone. Start practicing now. The quicker a child gets off a parent's payroll, the more likely they will be happy in life. I like that. Me too. Because, you know, it's funny, I gave this talk at USC and it was parents and kids and it was a really funny talk because depending on my answers, one of the two of them would be thrilled. You know, these, you know, parents stop crapping on millennials. You're the ones who parents them. Everyone's like, hey, the kids. Kids, get off the payroll. If you're such a tough guy, don't let your parents pay for your sneakers, your iPhones and your Uber parents would clap and I was watching this audience and the reality is there's two sides to every story. Um, And I talk a lot about putting pressure on modern day parenting and kids flood in, they're like, yeah Gary, you got my back and I'm like, stop taking mommy's money. And they're like, wait a minute. You know, because if they want the new Jordans or the new Supremes, right? Or if they want a new car, all of a sudden entrepreneurship is not as cool. You can do it yourself. They want entitlement. And there is no entitlement in entrepreneurship because once it goes real, it gets real fast. Yeah. Holiday's over. Holiday's over. I enjoyed my high school and college years. It was an eight year vacation. I packed in those hours because since then it's been real, real. Brilliant. I think that's all I need. Good. Gary, that's perfect, my friend.